So I'm going to do the introductions today, which is a little bit unusual. And I think I have to read my speech, but you'll see why. Um, so Danica, Dana Gal Goldthwaite Young is a professor of communication and political science at the University of Delaware, studying political media effects, public opinion, political satire, and the psychology of political humor. She got her undergraduate degree from the University of New Hampshire and earned her PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. Woohoo! Um, Dana's book, Wrong, How Media, Politics, and Identity Drive Our Appetite for Misinformation was published last year. And her book, Irony and Outrage, The Polarized Landscape of Rage, Fear, and Laughter in the US was published in 2020. Her TED Talk explaining how our psychology shapes our politics has been viewed over 2 million times. She is also a frequent commentator appearing on CNN, ABC News, PBS NewsHour, and NPR. I hear her often on our local WHYY station. Um, and she recently had a lovely conversation with Shankar Vedantam on uh, sitting on the episode of, um, it's called Sitting with Uncertainty on Hidden Brain Podcast, which is one of my favorites that I listen to every, every week. Um, there, Dana talked about her training as an improv comedian at Comedy Sports here in Philadelphia. So I don't normally introduce speakers, which is maybe evident by how nervous I am and that I have to read my speech, um, because there's usually somebody at Penn who is trained with our speaker or collaborated on research and is better positioned to introduce a speaker. But that didn't feel true this week. Um, I was at Dana's dissertation defense in 2007, not as a colleague, but as a friend. And it was at my Thanksgiving dessert that sent her infant son to the ER with an undiagnosed egg allergy, <laughs> which was not, which was not actually even the worst medical thing that happened that year. So um, that baby boy and my own are both now in college. So we've known each other a long time. Um, and while I've always known Dana as a whip smart, passionate, funny person, um, I never would have guessed that one day I would get to introduce my friend at a seminar for the center I run. Uh, so, but that's how life rolls sometimes. Um, so it's both smaller than you imagine and bigger. So I feel really lucky that I get to introduce my brilliant friend, Dana Young, uh, to the MindCore audience today to share her work. <laughs> this is such an honor. And um, yeah, Heather and I go back many, many years. We've camped together, done Thanksgivings together, been at each other's weddings. So this is quite an honor. Um, so, oh, I gotta say, got it, got it. Okay, it says it's being recorded. Okay, so that we can't pretend this never happened because it is going to be recorded. Um, so thank you so much for that, for that wonderful introduction. Um, I am going to speak to you today about my latest book, and about some really sort of big theoretical ideas. And it's a theoretical framework that I'm hoping can help open some new doors for folks. So I think of, I teach our, our graduate course on the epistemology of communication and sort of theory building. And I think of theory as a way to sort of organize really complex processes through a framework that may offer new ways of thinking, okay? And, and perhaps present new doors. That's how I think about theory. And so this framework that I'm offering is that. Um, so first, let me ask a question. And that is, uh-oh, uh-oh, hold on. This is not advancing, wait. just do it old school. Okay. First, I'll ask a question. And that is, um, could you please raise your hand if you would say that your main objective when you are making observations of the world most of the time is to be accurate in what you perceive most of the time. All right, so most of you would say that your main objective most of the time when you are perceiving the world is to be accurate. I'm here to tell you it's probably not, okay? 
Your goal, actually, when you are engaging the, with the world is probably, you want it, you want to think that it's to be accurate, but the reality is probably quite different. So, and I'll explain to you what your underlying motivations probably are in just a second. But first I'll say, um, this theoretical framework that I'm going to offer is a way of shifting our attention when we think about the misinformation crisis um, away from the supply of misinformation or the content of existing mis or disinformation to a, um, an examination that really focuses on the demand side. That is, why do we want it? So I came across this, this cartoon that really, instead of writing an entire book, I could have simply just posted this cartoon on Twitter. That is, the demand for comforting lies is far greater than, the, than is the demand for unpleasant truths. So, and I say this because the, the framework that I'm gonna offer integrates various levels of inquiry in various contexts. I'm gonna be talking a, a little bit about our psychological needs and social psychological needs. I'll be integrating that with our political history, our current political culture, and the incentives that drive our current political culture, and how all of these dynamics interact very synergistically with the economics and logics of our media systems. And together, all of these things contribute to our demand for misinformation, okay? And the reason that I, that I did this, I think mainly because I'm a full professor now, so I can kind of do what I want. And I was like, I wanna go big because I feel like any, any approach to the study of misinformation that just looks at supply, that just looks at spread, that just looks at platforms, or that just looks at our psychology, or that just looks at elite discourse of politicians, or that just looks at platform rules and content moderation. Any of those things in isolation is ignoring what is a very self-reinforcing system that is operating at scale every day. And so that's what I have tried to offer through this book. So to those of you who said that you think that most of the time your objective when you're engaging with the world is to be accurate in what you perceive, and I said it's probably not, the reason why that's the case is because what's probably guiding your perceptions of the world, because it guides all of our perceptions of the world, are what I call the three C's. And I borrow this really from um, literature, from conspiracy theory scholars, um, Susan Douglas, for example, but I actually just made it uh, a wonderful alliteration exercise. Comprehension, control, and community. Um, I believe that they call it epistemology, existential needs and social based needs. So but everyone likes the three C's. So comprehension, control and community. What we want is to feel as though we get it. We wanna feel like we understand what's going on. That's not to say that we want to necessarily understand accurately what's going on, but we wanna feel like we have an understanding of what's going on. That's comprehension. Number two is we wanna feel that we have some power, we have some agency. We all want to feel that we have some control over what's going on in our world. And number three is we want to feel like we're part of a community. And that's for obvious need, uh, obvious reasons, you know, rooted in um, evolutionary psychology. Obviously, we do not survive alone. We survive in groups. And so that need to feel like we're a part of a community is, I would say, kind of the super need that drives them all. And I say that because our need to feel like we're part of a community and that set of social needs extends to inform how we end up enacting our other two sets of needs. Meaning, we don't just want to feel like we understand the world, right? We want to comprehend the world in ways that are good for our team. We want to comprehend the world in the same way that our team does, right? We also want to control the world in ways that are good for our team. We want to feel that not just that we have power and agency, but that our team is empowered and has agency. And number three, when we, can, when we have that need for connection and community, we want to make sure that we are good members of our team and that we're like embracing the norms of our team, okay? We wanna be, we want to be good sort of prototypical exemplars of what it means to be a part of our community. So all of these three C's 
are informed through that sort of underlying social need. Okay, so the question then is, how do, how do those social needs shape what it is that we see and what it is that we know? So I'm going to sort of take you on a little bit of a journey about epistemology and how it is that we come to know the things that we know. And I would, I would start with a sort of rational model. The rational model that we all think, or we all want to believe informs our theories and values and beliefs and our knowledge is that we make observations of the world and then those observations update our theories, values, and beliefs, right? I base my theories, values, and beliefs on things that I learn, okay? So that is a rational model of epistemology. However, we also know that our theories, values, and beliefs shape the very things that we observe, okay? So we think we know about motivated reasoning, confirmation bias. We know that these things happen. And so even, you know, dating back to Norwood Russell Hansen or, or Thomas Kuhn, the notion that observations are theory laden, okay? Our observations are not operating in a vacuum. Our observations are already embedded with our underlying theories, values, and beliefs. But because we are social animals and because we are rooted in these social identities, those theories, values, and beliefs are tied to how we think of ourselves as members of a team, okay? So I argue that our social identity in those three Cs is itself shaping our theories, values, and beliefs, which then inform the observations that we make. Literally, how we think of ourselves is going to shape what it is we see. And there's ample empirical evidence that that is true. So I try to move us from the notion that um, observations are theory laden to the notion that observations may be identity laden. Okay. That social identity is so formative that it, that it itself informs what it is we see. So then of course the question arises. So where, where do these social identities come from? And if you are experts in social identity theory, I apologize for kind of dumbing it down. It's just for matters of time. And so I will give you my social identities because they're the ones I know best, okay? So we all have various social identities that we may tap into at any given moment in time, okay? You can think about them as wearing different hats. So I think of myself sometimes as a faculty member, the one on the left. I think of myself as a New Hampshireite, which is what we call people from New Hampshire. Uh, I think about myself as a mom, right? I am part of, of a parenting community. Although both of my kids are much bigger than that little icon baby right there. Um, and I also think of myself as an improv comedian because I'm a member of an improv company called Comedy Sports, but I also have like an instant bond with people who also do improv or do comedy. So these are all social identities that I have. These are all hats that I wear. But more importantly, these are all sort of glasses that I wear because when one of these is activated, I am seeing the world through the lens of that social identity. So now, social identities are malleable, right? They're affected by what is going on around us. So whether or not I think of myself as a faculty member or an improv comic or a mom, all these things are shaped by context. So I was ready to think of myself as, you know, faculty member, and then Heather starts talking about how our kids have known each other since they were babies, and all of a sudden, I'm putting my other hat on. And now I'm like, oh, that's right. I'm a mom. So these identities are very much in flux based on context. So now if you are around people who share a social identity with you, you're going to tend to have that salient or prominent in your mind. You're wearing that hat. You're wearing those glasses. You also may find that a particular social identity is really activated for you if you are the only one of those things in a group of others. Okay, so I don't necessarily think about myself. I live in New Jersey now, and I don't think about being from New Jersey all the time until I go to New Hampshire, because everyone reminds me that I'm from New Jersey, right? Especially the license plate, the whole thing. They, they say I have an accent now. So now it's like I'm other. So when you feel like other, your social identity is also salient. Um, and by and large, the most efficient way to activate a social identity is, unfortunately, by threatening it. 
And that is how this concept of social identity has become so paramount in American politics. And I'll just say, having gone to the American Political Science Association conference every year for the last 20 plus years, the concept of social identity was like a footnote for the first 10 years that I was going to these conferences. Now, social identity theory is so prominent, especially since 2016, social identity theory is informing what political scientists are doing every day. And I think that that is appropriate. Um, so because of this concept of identity threat that has become so paramount in Amer American politics. So why is that? Well, I argue, and many others argue as well, that the reason that that's the case is that this concept of a partisan mega identity has become so prevalent in American politics. And the reason that that is the case is that over the last 40 years, our political parties have gone through this transformation that have enabled for this concept that I will explain called partisan mega identities that then make that particular social identity salient all the time, threatened all the time, and informing what we see and what we believe all the time. So how this has occurred is you can really look at around the 1960s and 70s. When you look at the era of civil rights and the debate over civil rights in the United States, okay? We had a moment in American politics for many decades that our two political parties had a lot of mixed policy positions. There was a lot of compromise across the parties, et cetera. But a lot of that came about because of a great compromise on the issue of civil rights for black Americans. That Democrats and Republicans sort of had this silent agreement that, that was, they were just not going to touch that. With the great migration of former slaves from the South to cities North and West came an influx in African Americans in these cities that had claimed to embrace some progressive values. And the presence of these Black Americans forced their hand and said, if you, if you say that you are going to prioritize civil rights, show us. That party, we call that the partisan realignment because you know, the Republican party used to be the party of Abraham Lincoln, right? That is how that party switch occurred. So it became the Democratic Party that became the party of uh, civil rights and it became the Republican Party that became the party of states' rights. Now, a lot of times these, that sort of trend occurred in the South through a fusion of racial ideology with Christian ideology. And I say that because in the 1970s, as the as folks fled the Republican Party because they they were realizing that they wanted to champion civil rights and civil rights was the civil rights was sort of the centerpiece of the new Democratic Party. The question was, how are Republicans going to win at the ballot box without these bodies there? There were folks who recognized that there was an opportunity to create this sort of fusion of racial and Christian identity. And chief among those people was a man named Paul Weyrick. If you're not familiar with the name Paul, Paul Weyrick, I'll tell you a story. And the story is that in the era of the segregation, in the, I'm sorry, in the era of desegregation of American public schools, of the integration of American public schools, there were a lot of white people who were unhappy with the idea that their children would be going to school with black children. So they used a loophole, which was they could send their kids to Christian schools, which just happened to be white. And those Christian schools were tax exempt right, because they were religious institutions. And so for a while that was working for these white parents. The Nixon administration, and this is crucial for you to understand, Republican administration, the Nixon administration said that is a violation of our national policy on uh, against segregate, segregated schools. You are no longer going to have tax exempt status if you continue to operate this way. 
these parents were very unhappy and they felt very threatened. And it was Paul Weyrich who began to mobilize and activate this entire community of evangelical Christians based on this desire for segregated schools. So we have that fusion of racial ideology and religious ideology all the way back to the 1970s and 80s. Now, does anyone know who Paul Weyrich was? He was the founder of the, the Heritage Foundation. So if you don't know what the Heritage Foundation is, if you've heard of the document Project 2025, that is a document that was created by the Heritage Foundation. So we're, we're kind of living, we're, we're living in the same reality that we've been living in for many decades, okay? But this is how it's played out. So now what, once the, once there was this sort of fusion of racial and religious ideology with a Republican party conservative ideology, we witnessed over almost a half century of Americans sorting themselves into political parties, not based on issue positions alone, although that they matter, but really based on identity characteristics, okay? So this is a concept we call social sorting. Matt Lewandowski, who's here at Penn, he's worked in this space. Um, Liliana Mason, her book, Uncivil Agreement, was so essential to my thinking in this area. Um, so the social sorting process kind of looks like this. It used to be, right, that within each of the parties, you had maybe a little overlap of some identity characteristics, like where you live, your political beliefs, culture, racial makeup, your religion, as the parties become more sorted, the Venn diagram gets a little more condensed, right? So we see a little bit more intercorrelation within party between all of these various identity characteristics. And obviously this is just sort of a caricature of what this looks like. This isn't like actual data behind this. This is just for you to get a visualization of what this looks like. Another way that I've started to think about it is what, what social sorting looks like. Cause I think that it's kind of intuitive for folks is increasingly Americans within each of these parties check all the boxes, okay? So if you are a Republican, chance, statistically, chances are greater than ever that you are white, evangelical Christian, live in a rural place, and hold traditional conservative cultural values, okay? It's not fully determined, obviously. Like, it's not like the R square is like one. That's not how this works. It's just that it is more likely than ever that these are going to be true. Whereas if you're a registered Democrat, chances are you are from a racially or ethnically um, diverse group, you're from a minority group, or you identify closely with minority groups, which is important. Um, you identify as secular or agnostic, you live in a suburban or urban area, and you hold progressive cultural values. Now, politically, there are all kinds of consequences of this. But in terms of psychology, and social psychology in particular, there are also important consequences of this. Because when you look around and people on your team share a lot of fundamental characteristics with you, you your sense of social identity gets more and more prominent in your mind, okay? Because now your team, it's not just a team along one dimension. This team is on a whole ton of dimensions and primal dimensions. If you look around and you're like, members of my party look like I do. They worship the way I do. They live similarly to me. They live in similar places to me. They hold similar values to me. Take it further. They listen to similar music. They eat similar food. They take their coffee similar ways, right? They drive similar trucks. All of these things contribute to the salience of one's social identity. So the result, and this is where Lily Mason's book is, has been really helpful, is the construction of these political mega identities. Um, perhaps you've seen a bumper sticker like this that, that sort of links together these religious and issue positions with politics. Um, I know many of you have seen this one. I see it all over West Philly. Um, the in this, how many of you have seen the in this house, we believe signs? Okay, so now, I think this is really interesting, and I have my own beliefs about this, but when you think about the clustering that is going on here, it is a clustering of 
racial ideology, gender ideology, um, values on um, related to nationalism versus globalism, epistemological orientation to the world, the notion that science is real. So it's like literally integrating all of these things into one cohesive political mega identity. It's interesting. So when we hold mega identities, when we check all the boxes or we check a lot of the boxes, the mega identities become number one, salient, number two, attention getting, right? It's easy to get our attention through appeals that activate them. They are emotionally activating identities. So the second that those identities are tapped into, you have an emotional response about that identity. They're also especially mobilizing, okay? If you check all the boxes for your team and someone makes a pitch to you based on your identity, based on your mega identity, it is gonna be very easy to get you to do something and to get you to behave certain ways, especially in the interest of your team goals. So I ask the question, is it possible then that these political identities are also then exploitable because they are so readily activated? So what I'm going to now do, so this, that is the framework for the first half of the book, okay? Which is this integration of social psychology with our political history and our political cultural context. But I'm also a media scholar. So I'd say I'm actually first and foremost a media scholar. So then where do media organizations and media effects come in? And that's the second half of the book. So you may recall this model here, right? That our social identity is actually shaping what it is we see. Even though what we see, we like to think, updates our theories and values and beliefs. At the end of the day, our social identity is also shaping the very things that we see, right? So I'm gonna to talk to you now about how four different entities tap into our social identity, usually through identity threat, and offer up to us things that we then look to as observations of the world that then further shape what we see, thus crystallizing our political mega identities, okay? So the first of these, I'm gonna to talk to you about political elites, I'll talk to you about um, traditional journalism. I'll talk to you about partisan news and social media, each of which reinforce and crystallize our partisan mega identities through slightly different mechanisms, okay? So the first one are political elites. So we know that political elites are anticipating the social identity of their base, right? They're saying, okay, well, this is what my base believes in. Um, what's a good way to get them activated? Identity threat. So I'm going to create messaging that um, articulates some kind of very clear identity threat. That's going to get them emotionally activated, pay attention, and they're going to want to vote for me or do what I suggest they should do. Now, what's happening then is whatever they say, whether it's a tweet or a speech or a political ad or you know say maybe something at a rally, all of the things that they offer up become part of the observations of the world that their supporters then make, right? But those observations themselves have been informed by this sort of message curation by political elites who are already seeking to activate social identity in this way. Okay, and I'll keep it right there, okay. So a lot of this is about identity threat, as I said, because it's so mobilizing. Usually these political elites are focused on nationalized culture war issues because where we see the biggest wedge of all is not on issues related to fiscal policy, but it usually is on these issues related to um, gender, race, um, crime, immigration, et cetera. So that is where we see the, the bulk of these identity threat appeals in, in the context of those culture war issues. And this is kind of an interesting proposition that this comes from my friends, Dan Kreis, Regina Lawrence, and Shannon McGregor, who suggested that because of the nature of American politics now, you have partisan leaders who are not just trying to say, oh, look, I own this issue that you're passionate about. No, no, no. They're trying to say, I own the identity of our team. 
They're trying to become the sort of prototypical exemplar, the best example of what it means to be a Republican or a Democrat. And this is further worsened by the nature of our primary system. Gerrymandering, non-competitive political districts, right? So you have folks who are running for office in the primaries who know that once they win, they're gonna be holding national office because it is a reliably blue district or blue state or red state, right? So what happens in the primary campaigns in those places is that you have political elites who are messaging to the margins, messaging to the fringe, further anticipating social identity, right? So this is how you end up with some of the kind of outrageous topics and allegations that are sort of bandied about, especially during primary campaigns. Um, okay. I don't know how many of you recall this. This is Senator Ted Cruz. And this was at the nomination hearing for Justice Katanji Brown Jackson. Uh, does anyone remember watching this at all? A little bit? Okay. So what was happening here was a display. This is a, a prototypical partisan performance. This was a display of identity ownership on the part of Senator Cruz, who, when then Judge Jackson was being questioned, he said, you are on the board of this private school. Um, I think maybe her children go there. He's like, and this book is in the library of that school. And this book is called Anti-Racist Baby. And the book claims that babies um, are basically are born racist and are taught to be racist. And so he said, do you agree or disagree that babies are racist? So now, was this a, an actual information seeking question or was this a spectacular performance of identity and identity threat? I would argue that all of the allegations of CRT. Did you hear about the critical race theory and allegations that CRT is being taught in schools and we have to get CRT out of the schools when actually CRT is not taught in schools because it's like a legal theory. Um, those, that kind of, those allegations and those topics were very much designed to activate identity threat on the part of Republicans who may check all those boxes, okay? And they very much are similar to the mobilizing function that Paul Weyrich played back in the 1970s. Um, okay. So now I argue that even in the realm of traditional journalism and traditional news, I'm talking the New York Times, Washington Post, um, even your, your broadcast network, the nightly news broadcast that based on the advertising only old people watch. Um, though even those programs, activate social identity and offer up content that then furthers our social identity. Now, how? They're not doing it in the same way that political elites do, right? Because they're not trying to mobilize people with identity threat to like get us to vote a certain way. But some of the habits and routines of journalism still activate our political mega identities by default. Maybe you have noticed in the context of election coverage, it's very much strategy framing, left versus right. And it's framed aggressively in terms of a battle and a war between the left and the right. Um, this will inevitably, inevitably cause people to think of themselves in terms of their political team. There is also, because of the economics of journalism, the unfortunate reality of journalists, even at our elite institutions, rewarding performances of identity ownership by political elites, okay? We witness a whole lot more coverage of the uh, individuals within Congress who hold the most extreme positions, but most importantly, who engage in the most spectacular displays to activate identity threat. Um, I generally say there is no reason that all of us should know the name of a congresswoman from rural Georgia. But Marjorie Taylor Greene is exceptional at understanding how identity ownership and these displays are rewarded by these journalistic incentives, okay? 
um, and national culture war issues, uh, the debate over LGBTQ issues, trans rights, CRT, um, immigration, gun control, abortion, those culture war issues are profitable. They operate at 30,000 feet. They are um, issues that you can talk about with actu without actually having to do necessarily like original investigative reporting. You can talk about what people are talking about rather than you know doing original reporting on some new development. Um, everyone understands what they are. Everyone has some emotional response to them. Interestingly, if you look at um, local newspapers, for example, I'll talk about the death of local news in one second, but you know, not only are local newspapers dying, but there's also the consolidation of ownership across local newspapers and across local television news affiliates. So you may have heard of like Sinclair Broadcasting Group, right? So Sinclair Broadcasting Group is, it's a, a corporation that owns many different local news affiliates all across the country. One of the ways that they make a ton of money and they save a ton of money is by not engaging in original reporting for each of the locales where they have affiliates, but it's on, by focusing on readily familiar national culture war issues that then emotionally activate viewers wherever, whatever town, whether it's Peoria or San Diego or Philadelphia or Trenton, whatever, it activates everyone. So they're saving money by not creating original content for each of those affiliates. Um, and that is going hand in hand with this death of local newspapers. The reason that this is important, by the way, and there's some exceptional work on this from um, Joanna Dunaway and Josh Darr and Matthew Hitt, local newspapers are not just amazing in terms of holding local public officials to account. They do that, that's good, okay? The other thing that they do is they offer citizens in those locales an alternative to a political mega identity because local community newspapers activate our membership on a whole different team. We're a member of this team, right? We're the, on the West Philly team, we're the Philadelphia team, or we're the, you know, I had in Township, New Jersey team. And when you activate that identity, it's through how we all have shared goals about filling potholes, right? Making sure that the school library doesn't have a leak in the ceiling, et cetera. Like, oh, we've de we all know that that traffic light at third and main doesn't turn fast enough. And we all share that frustration. Those shared community goals activate a shared community identity that is cross-cutting in terms of partisanship. And they, there's evidence that when you have local newspapers that engage in that kind of reporting, instead of just more national BS, you actually reduce what's called affective polarization among the people in those communities. You reduce the dislike or hatred for their political outgroup. Uh, okay. So if you wanna know what st strategy framing looks like, I don't even think I need this slide. You could actually just go on CNN or New York Times or Washington Post because we have like 22 days until the election and it is all strategy all the time. Um, strategy framing is interesting to me because it draws its language from war and it's, it tends to be very violent. So newly aggressive Biden, this is from several months ago, obviously. Newly aggressive Biden shifts from compromise to combat, um, battle for Senate, Biden-Trump rematch. It's all these languages that are slightly sports framed, but usually with a, a like a nod to like war violence. Um, so I would challenge you to see if you can find election coverage out there that doesn't do this. If it doesn't do this, what, what does it do? We can't even imagine. If it doesn't do this, it does what's called issue framing, which is really focusing on public policy debate and distinct issue positions held between the candidates, as opposed to aggressive battle fighting rematch. Okay. Probably the easiest one to understand in terms of how it, it draws upon identity and 
further activates identity threat is partisan media. Okay, so this is like Fox, MSNBC. There's also the the online like Newsmax, One America. These are organizations that thrive on political sectarianism. This is what they do. Um, the economics of partisan media like these are just rooted directly in outrage. Outrage content is us versus them, conflicting value systems. Identity threat is its biggest weapon. It's like the special sauce of partisan media. Um, what I would say too is we know from some amazing reporting on Tucker Carlson's show before he was booted from Fox, which is still shocking to me, but um, that the use of data analytics and minute to minute data analytics within these media organizations is so on point that they know exactly what kind of content, what kind of language furthers attention and gets people to live tweet something or share something online while they're watching. So the reason there, there is, are some revelations that the reason that Tucker Carlson focused so much, for example, on like migrant caravans coming over the southern border was because the minute to minutes showed that that is what caused people to stay on the show, not change the channel and actively share things online about the show. So th that, that sort of robust use of data analytics furthers these dynamics. Uh, so for examples of what this looks like, uh, Tucker Carlson covering immigration. Fox News still on immigration is still, still kind of floating in this space, even without Tucker. And then on the left, let the left does identity threat too, folks. Uh, they just cover Fox News. And if you think that that's not identity threat, it absolutely is. So um, when I did an analysis of which outlets were most likely to cover that Ted Cruz critical race theory, like performance, Ted Cruz is more rewarded even by MSNBC than he is by Fox because MSNBC rebroadcasts those identity displays to activate identity threat for their liberal audience. Okay. So you know, they're all, in, they're all complicit. So social media, perhaps this is really intuitive, but um, I'm just gonna highlight some of the really kind of fascinating ways in which social media contribute to these identity laden observations. Um, social media platforms need our emotional reactions. They need them. The reason that they need them is that the economics of social media are predicated on our data and our activity online. If we do not do things online, they are not able to then target us with ads. They need us to like things, to share things, to react to things, to comment on things. If we don't do that, they're not able to then make literally hundreds of billions of dollars. I mean, I don't know if you know, Meta is an advertising company. Like 98% of Meta's profits come from advertising. It's hundreds of billions of dollars. And they cannot do that if we do not do things online. So they need us to be emotional online. One of the most, um, one kind of content that is most likely to go viral is content that is both moral and emotional. So moral content says how things should be or how things should not be and does so in a very emotional way with emotional language. So this comes from um, Jay Van Bevel and Dominic Packer. And um, there's extensive work that like, this is the special sauce of virality. What that means though, is you gotta figure out what kinds of messages are most, are, are easy to make moral and emotional. And the answer is social identity messages. Cause it's like the way that we do things is the right way. The way that they do things is the wrong way. So. Moral emotional content is almost universally social identity content. Uh, performances of social identity on social media are huge. You may find that you have some particular social identity and you're connected with a lot of folks online who share that social identity. And we all wanna be good members of our team online. We don't wanna be chastised. We don't wanna be told that we're acting out of line with our team. So the performances that we offer up are usually themselves curated. 
right? Because we want to make sure that we are good partisan prototypes. So if you do hold an issue position out of line with your team, you'll probably be quiet on that one, right? Right. When I have a, a very liberal social network and when the left was yelling defund the police, everyone got real quiet. No one wanted to say that's probably not a great message. Not a lot of people will agree that we should pull all the funding from police officers. So like th those moments where people are like self-selecting what, what they're going to perform and what they're going to say, I think those are really important to note. Um, and of course, on social media, all of the micro-level targeting and data analytics itself offers up content, paid for content, that is directly designed to tap into our social identity and reinforce it. Uh, and you may like this. Remember the, the performance from Ted Cruz? Well, later in the day, LA Times photographer caught Ted Google, or, or looking on Twitter for his own name to see if he had been adequately uh, rewarded for his display earlier that morning. And to me, this doesn't just illustrate the social media piece of this, but really this illustrates how all of these four entities, right? Political elites, journalism, partisan news, and social media, they operate synergistically anticipating the logics and economics of each other. Um, Anyway, it's, I, that's like, I literally paid $500 so I could put this in my book because I'm like, this is my book right here. Is Ted Cruz like looking for his own name on Twitter? Okay. So without being depressing, what can we do? Um, I'm going to go quickly through the first two and then I'll focus on us as individuals. So in journalism, there are a lot of folks who are saying, let's focus on democracy-centered reporting. Let's focus on, on reporting that is specifically about democratic health and always centers democratic health with every decision that is made. Um, it's, I think, difficult to do, but I think it's possible. Objectively hold leaders accountable to empirical truth when they say things that are untrue. Uh, abandon the partisan conflict frame. There are ways of, of reporting on elections that are not rooted in that partisan strategy frame, attacking battle war language. One of my favorites is investing in independent community-centered journalism that would prime community rather than partisan identity. And with um, our colleague here at Penn, Victor Picard, who's written on this forever, investing in a healthy public media infrastructure that's protected from the demands for profit. The United States is weird. We are weird in a thousand ways, but one of the ways that we are weird is that we do not fund public media. And you say, well, NPR, PBS, those are barely taxpayer funded entities. They're funded by viewers like you. Um, and that's why we have pledge drives. So when you look at the actual amount of funding for these organizations that comes from um, taxpayer dollars, it's very small. In other Western democracies, they have not only robust public media infrastructures, but they are consumed by a whole lot of the public, right? Like the BBC in the UK is consumed by a whole lot of the public. Um, you also have in those countries a plan for the longevity of these public media organizations. Um, in social media, I just have two suggestions, demands maybe, uh, transparency, and making anonymized data available to researchers. And we've been yelling about this for a very long time and Meta never wants to play, but I will beat this drum as long as I can. I'll tell you that with the um, Digital Services Act in, the, in Europe that requires transparency, requires large platforms to make user data available to users, I do think that we're gonna see a bit of movement because as is, Typical, Europe is already moving, and the US maybe will catch some of those fun fumes on their way out, um, but hopefully we'll see movement on this. Now, from each of us, number one, we can reshuffle the deck. Part of that um, is related to the performances of political identity that we engage in, in person or on social media. 
So disrupting political identities means that when you have, when there's an issue that you're not totally on the same page as your team on, say it, communicate that. Um, is there a social risk there? There might be. But if you think about the fact that each of us has a role in shaping the information environment. We're no longer passive recipients, right? It's not 1982, we're, we're at home watching three networks. We are all active producers of content. So being honest in your displays of political ideology or position taking, if you do not hold the same view as other people on your team, say it, right? that would reshape our political information environment a little bit where it wasn't so uniformly bifurcated. Next, giving the benefit of the doubt. Even if you look at someone and they check all the boxes, either under Republican or Democrat, chances are their issue positions are way more nuanced than you would assume. Did you know, you, you probably wouldn't know, that there is huge agreement across Americans on abortion. There is huge agreement across Americans on gun control. Did you know that? Did you know that the vast majority of Americans support access to safe abortions in the first trimester of pregnancy? Overwhelming majority. You would never know that. And a lot of the people who support that, guess what? They may check all the boxes on the Republican side and they still hold that view. On the topic of guns, the overwhelming majority of Americans support background checks, supports um, licenses for gun owners and supports some limitations on automatic weapons. You would not know that from the sort of elite discourse and from identity threat performances. Okay. Oh. In other words, just because someone seems to check all the boxes and you're like, I'm not gonna deal with them, you are doing democracy a disservice and yourself a disservice because chances are you have a lot more in common than what you disagree with. Changing how and why we engage with news and social media. So on social media, I said, be honest. When you don't agree with your team, put it out there. Be like, yeah, I, I, under, I respect where you're coming from, but I, I do see it differently. Be, be really mindful about what is good for democracy as you engage with news. When you think about what stories you're going to reshare, are you gonna reshare the hyper-aggressive strategy frame story? Are you going to um, retweet or reskeet if you're on Blue Sky, a story that is super like outrage inducing? Even if it feels good, like, oh, I can't believe these bastards, share. Hold on and think again, what, is, what role are you playing in this machinery, right? And do you necessarily wanna play that role? And my favorite of all is the concept that some of you may be familiar with, which is getting increasing scholarly attention, and that is called intellectual humility. Perhaps ironically, the more open we are to the possibility we might be wrong, the more likely we are to be right because the more open you are to the possibility that your own belief system and your own knowledge might have some holes in it, the more likely you are to be actively open-minded thinking, engaging with the world from a place of curiosity constantly, constantly looking for opportunities to update your belief system. And as a result, you become the person who is most likely to get to empirical truth. Um, and that's it. Thanks. So I hope that I didn't like completely depress you. Yes. Oh, please tell me um, who you are. Uh, yeah. My name is Bill Sorici. I'm the Associate Director of Mind Sport. Great. Um, thanks so much for an interesting talk. Um, I especially, a few things I, I wanted to ask about. Um, mm -hmm. But first, I wanted to thank you for like highlighting the importance of like local news. <laughs> like yeah. my own political identity was like so shuffled when I moved to Philadelphia and started thinking much more about like state and local politics, mm -hmm. like the new dimensions and like intra-party and factional yeah. uh, debates there. Um, um, 
That's really great. I also really liked how you identified both like system wide and individual level changes that we can make. I think right. people are like, it has to be one or the other. Yeah, thank and, you. Yeah. And then finally, I wanted to ask a question um, about some of those system level changes. Um, They're so hard. Well, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how to get them to happen. Is that the question? Basically, okay. yeah. Yeah. I know. Um, so one of the, this is like the biggest obstacle in thinking about, and, and there's even bigger system level changes that would make, that would solve problems even faster. Okay. One other system level change is like getting rid of partisan gerrymandering. If we didn't have gerrymandered congressional districts, a lot of things would change in terms of how, who was rewarded, how people campaign, etc. But like, I can't write a whole book about how that would solve the problem because it's never going to, we're not there. Just, I can't imagine that in the next like decade. When it comes to journalism, um, what I see in the realm of journalism in particular is an interest in finding alternative pathways because there are, you see nonprofit news organizations that are popping up. You see philanthropic organizations looking to put funds behind some kind of alternative models. You also see within ind individual journalists a recognition that, wow, perhaps constantly rewarding these displays of like identity threat or identity ownership, perhaps they're not great for democracy. And I, I know that these conversations are happening in newsrooms at our legacy news organizations. I know they're happening. The economics of the news industry is such that I'm, I'm not sure how they get from conversation to action. Um, but yeah, what, what what do you think? I don't know. I mean, I, I sort of this, uh, I mean, one concern, right, about like, public media in the United States, right, is that it's very like, left coded. Correct. Uh, yeah. How is it in like the UK with the BBC? The, so the audience, the reason that it's left coded is because of the nature of the audience. So in the B, uh, for, in the UK, the BBC audience, it leans a little bit left, but very much center. It leans as much left as like the audience of um, our national news, network news programs, like that left. Um, the difference in the United States is that we have a very well-funded conservative media enterprise that has a giant audience. There are right-wing media outlets in other countries. They do not get the size of the audience that Fox News gets. So that is the issue. So because conservatives flock to Fox and it has a huge audience, the NPR audience, for example, yeah, it is a liberal audience. When you do content analyses of the, the content of national public radio, it is very difficult to suggest that it is inherently or has an inherent liberal bias. It might lean a little left, but what makes those allegations stick is the audience profile, which is overwhelmingly liberal. And I try to always point out, but there's a difference between the socio-demographic profile of an audience and the content of the programming, you know, and that's, that's a very challenging thing to pull apart. Sure. Oh, great. Oh, awesome. So the beginning of your talk, you talked about something from your aspect of our public sector stance, reminded me of foundational work in technology or social science about how you can find one aspect of someone's identity to flexibly in the moment change how they define us. Yes. I'm interested in how you think that relates to this idea of like mega identity. Yep. So how these political identities So one of the, I know that there is work, there's priming work. I think Matt Lewandowski's done some of it where you can prime a national identity. And indeed, when you prime a national identity or sort of a patriotic identity, it does reduce some of these sort of partisan motivated reasoning processes that we're very familiar with. 
I'm also really nervous about priming a national identity because I don't know that that's even that's necessarily great. Um, but the, but the mechanism does does work, and that's what I think that we're witnessing at the level of um, communities with those community newspapers, right? That that's that's the mechanism through which that's happening. My concern is that our fragmented media environment, coupled with the mm, sort of hyper fragmented media economics love this stuff. Like they benefit from this stuff. If you have readily activated identities that, you know, couple very nicely with different kinds of cultural practices and again, like cars and foods and music. And that is really good for a lot of entities that stand to make a whole lot of money so the, the, the priming apparatus, is it possible? Yes. I'm not sure that the economic incentives are there right now to offer some alternative like disrupting identity that could be leveraged in such a way that it could not just like, you know, activate emotions, but get people to like buy stuff and listen to certain music. And that's, that's the part of it that is, that has me puzzled. Yeah, that is a great point. So what I think is so interesting is that the, the sort of mobilization, just for as an aside for a second, the fact that Christianity and whiteness became part of this sort of like rural, culturally conservative identity is so fascinating to me because there is such an opportunity for cross-cutting inroads into older black communities where Christianity and cultural conservatism are like very salient. Um, I think that there are opportunities there for what I always think about as identity disruption, right? I think that what we're seeing with Tim Walls, for example, is kind of like the opposite side of that coin, where he's like, look at me, I'm a white guy, I'm from a rural town, I fix trucks, I have a gun, I go hunting, there's a seat for you at this table, right? I think that there, I think there are always ways to disrupt those identities. In terms of, I'll tell you, one of the things that we know is happening right now is that there are members of that sort of subgroup, um, older Christian, culturally conservative black, especially men who are experimenting with a Trump vote because of the cultural conservatism, because of a discomfort with the issue of like transgenderism, um, because of the discussion of like Christianity at the center. So that is, that is something that is kind of being used to kind of bring other folks to the table. Now, for democracy, it would actually be very good for that to happen, right? For democracy, it would actually be really good for folks who hold, who don't check all the boxes, who check the opposite boxes to actually have a different political affiliation. Yeah. Do you mean way differently in terms of like, whether they're at the top of your mind? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I hear what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, I think, 
Yeah, I think that what I think what you're saying is right. It probably is on an individual basis in terms of the extent to which each one is going to inform your vote choice. I'll tell you what I talk a lot about in the book is that this social sorting has been asymmetrical. It has resulted in a Republican Party that is far more internally homogenous along sociodemographic lines. It's a lot messier in the Democratic Party. There's more sameness in the in within the Democrats than there was 20 years ago, but you're not looking at nearly as homogenous a group, which is also why it becomes more difficult to target with messaging, to mobilize, et cetera, because within the Democratic Party, you have so many subgroups, right? The big tent party, et cetera. Um, you can think about that with regards to the, the head of the Teamsters, right? A union that has historically always endorsed a Democrat the head of the Teamsters spoke at the Republican National Convention because when they surveyed all of their members, a lot of the Teamsters were Trumpers and they wanted to be consistent. So, right. So you, these, there are these cross cutting identities. And my sense is that when you look under the hood for the Democrats, there are probably a, because of the heterogeneity sociodemographically, there probably are a lot of other factors that are shaping how they're thinking about their vote. Yeah. Sure. I am just like my focus on here. Great. Uh, can I have a question? Like your your talk um, reminds me of a movement in sociology, I think, from uh, Daniel de la Costa, like this this funny sounding paper, a white liberals in Nafis. Oh yeah, yeah, with um with Mutz. Yeah. Yeah. Wasn't Mutz on that too? I thought Diana Mutz was on that. Yeah, it was like lattes versus like black coffee. Yes, yeah, yeah. So yeah. What they do, uh, and that's what I've been doing, so that's why I'm asking. Okay, like yeah. They build like, uh, models of collective uh, dynamics, and they try and see if they can essentially explain like this, this, this outcome that okay. those politics are related to lifestyles. Okay. And, and do you see any hope that? such a model could also work in your case because you're laying out this this theoretical framework and yeah. it, to me it, it screams for for like like mechanistic models where you describe how agents would interact with each other what? and they have to more or less and then you because then you can kind of implement your your um your assumptions about these local newspapers and things like that yeah yeah so what you were describing is exactly what my doctoral student brooke came to me and said I read your book. I think we need to do exactly what you're saying. And I said, okay, figure out how to do that. And we can do that. So I would love to follow up with you because I know that she's really interested. In, and it's almost like simulation, right? Is it kind of like, it a, is. okay, it is, it is a simulation. Okay. And then you can kind of make tweaks to any individual factor and see what that would do to the system. Yeah. That is exactly. Okay. Yeah. 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 I would love to do that. Cool. Yeah, no, thank you. Your characterization of this is big that we have a lot of unknown. I'm trying to understand uh being a rich suburban type. Mm -hmm. Like what's their deal? They don't have guns, they don't have trucks, they don't listen to country music. Like, there are a lot of social markers that I think they don't. No, you're right, you're right. So what, what how, it, it, like, is it a problem to the kind of theory you're proposing or like, how should we think about it? That's a great question. Or, yeah, so like, one, of, yeah, one of the pieces that is that I'm wrestling with, it's not here, is the concept of sort of um, like, masculinity and like traditional gender roles outside of being informed by Christianity. Um, and that is not accounted for here because you're absolutely right. You know, we're trying to, I'm doing the whole project on Joe Rogan right now and trying to figure out how he fits in, right? With his sort of like model of masculinity. And my understanding is Trump's, you know, Trump's new pitch about um, I'm a protector. I protect women 
is designed to reach those exact voters you're talking about. They're like, oh, he's going to protect me. Um, so there's something about gender ideology that is in there that, and gender ideology is often tied to Christianity, but there's something unique going on. Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks. Thanks, guys.